Uh, I, I so, um, I've got an intro, it's all going to be great. Okay. Uh, so, I'm Johnny Galt, I'm the narrative director of Inkle, we're a, a digital contractive fiction company. We made the sorcery adaptations and 80 days, and we just became involved, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've done a ton of interactive writing at this point. I finally call myself a writer, but I've never written a paper game book ever. Not one. Never done it. Um, so, I thought that was quite an interesting place to be. So when we were put on this panel, and we didn't really know quite how to do it, I thought I would co-opt it into sort of career advice and ask these two wonderful gentlemen who have written many, many paper game books. This wonderful gentleman and the other one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all about how they do it. So this is a panel on how you construct interactive narratives, or really, how do you construct, I'm really interested in how do you construct game books, in particular games, because I've never done it, and I would love to know it, oh my god. Um, so, uh, <laughs> right. That's, that, probably, that's how you do it. That's probably a quarter of a game book, isn't it? Is that a quarter of a book? No, no, that's the whole book. Oh, thing, is it? Oh, wow. Yeah, it's wow. number, number one here. And I think you'll well, find... This is a little tip for you, Peter. Number 400 down there. It's a bit late now, but I used to get A3 sheets. Starting with 20 A4s together. I'm writing this down. Yeah, I am. A3. Far, far too late. So, um... Let's guess what the book of that is. Uh, well, you can probably... Uh, sorry, I need to speak into this, don't I? Um, you can probably tell if you look if you if you look at it because there are there are character names dotted around and they're quite small it's, though. But it's all but it's all quite small. If it was you, fine, you want to go that way? That's what I would get for this. I'd write lots more notes. Go that way. Yeah, you go that way. Don't go this way. I don't notice my every paragraph about what I was going to write. So which which book is this, Peter? This is this is spectral stalkers. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, spectral spectral stalkers. <laughs> So this, I think, leads me into what was my first question, which was, uh, let's go back in time. You're, back you're in about time. to start a game book, you've just had the idea, you've woken up, you're in the bath, you're in the shower, wherever it is, you go, this is it, I'm going to make a game book about, whatever it's about, croquet, not the latest, I don't know. Um, how do you start? What's the first thing you do? This cannot possibly be the first thing you do. No, um, the, the, the first thing you have, I, I mean, I don't know, it may be different for other people, but the first thing I have is a story. I, it's a story I want to tell. So, so um, a linear story. So a, a, a linear story uh, in, in, in chronological order, you, you, it, it's a, um, and the, all of the byways are, as it were, diversions, digressions from that. But, you, but, but, but there, is a, there is a thread, which is the, which, so you, you, you come up first of all with, the, with I mean, there was one I, there was one I didn't, get to write, which was going to be called The King's Barbican Jewel, um, uh, and uh, the, the basics, and, and, and the idea there was uh, you're helping to, you, you, you've been told to find this treasure, but it turns out that in fact the treasure is, a, is in fact a kidnapped princess, and and, 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 and that was kind of the germ of the idea, and then I, I built on that, well, where, what kind of what kind of locations would that happen in? How would you go about who, who's done the kidnapping? How would you go about it, doing the rescue? What kind, of, uh, what kind of problems might you encounter as you're running away with the princess? How easy is it to run away with a bloody princess, you know? And, and, um, and, and, um, and very expensive, really. <laughs> and, 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 and you, so, so actually, it, it is a, as far as I'm concerned, anyway, it is, it, it's, it's like a novel, it's, it, it's, it's a proper story. Um, and then, and then you, and then you start. Well, number one, where does it start? Yeah. Um, so that, that's how I get into it. So, do you, do you think the players would be able to tell the, the the true course of the game, where the real plot lies, from the byways? And, or do you think you well, play? once you get into it, you you can actually create, and you you almost you're obliged to create alternative routes to success. So it's not just. So although I've come up with one thread with one idea, which is my kind of inspiration, the, 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 the idea behind the book. Um, it's, uh, you, you then create alternatives, alternative routes. Uh, but, I mean, you can see from here, for instance, there are, there's about, there's about ten arrows going to number, going to number two, three, four. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, and, you know, there are lots of places where you have to go in order to, in order, or one, not, not, there are one or two places that you have to go 
to, for the for the for the story to, to, to run properly. But there are plenty of but there are plenty of ways to get there, and that's always yes. how you have to do it. Well, well, how about you, Jamie? It's a very similar process. Most of nearly all of my books have always been done with someone else. So first of all, we sit down and bounce ideas off. But one of the advantages of doing a series like, for instance, Way of the Tiger, the whole law and world happened out of that, which is also in Talisman of Death, the first fight fantasy, was from my writing partner's uh, Dungeons & Dragons campaign. So it really helped that whatever the plot, we already had a plot worked out for the 12 books. We only managed to do six before we died of too much game book writing, uh, sort of thing, crazy. But uh, because you can then work out various plot lines, we tend to have always traditionally most game books, especially Final Fantasy, have three routes to success. And along with those different paths, you would have nodal points where all those routes might meet. You might have two or three of those, like Peter was demonstrating there. And along the way, there might be several crossover moments when you move from one thread to another, which gets more complicated the more you do that, because you have to try and remember what happened before, not necessarily in terms of items, you always have to think of some method by which you can find out from the player what he's done, which you normally can do. Uh, but with the world of the Way of the Tiger, it made it so much easier, because we said they need to go to this city, and we had everything about what that city was like. And also, campaigns had been played in that world, so we had characters that were based on people who spent ten years playing that character, so we know what happened to them. We knew their storyline, and all that stuff would happen in the background, and it made the world feel much more real. And that was, but it also made it a lot easier to plot stuff because you already, like, if you wanted to arrive at the capacity of a city on the way to rescue the princess, you had to design the city from scratch. We already knew. Yeah, it was absolutely. A, you were yeah. cheating. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't understand your point. <laughs> so, how knew the high priest was, and who the governor of the city, and that kind of thing. But, we might talk again in a minute about how you find out what the player's been doing and how it can affect the world in a different way, but that's different from fighting fantasy. So, what I find interesting about that is neither of you mentioned maps at all. I don't think either of you used the word map. Now, when I, writing, when I was writing the sorcery adaptations, the map was pretty much the first thing I sketched down and I just filled in the locations as I went along. That's a very classic computer well, game way to do things. Where the time that we had all these maps already done, mm -hmm. And for a couple of the, uh, they were sort of add-ons at the end, actually. They were just art requirements for the two fighting fantasies we did. Um, there's a Falcon time travel series, which is really neat maps for that. But the Fabled Lands books, which some of you may, 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 may be aware of, were very map-driven. So that we did start with a sense of a map. And it's literally sketched on an A3 piece of paper, <laughs> rather than a tape, tiny little post-it notes, 100 of them. And uh, then we would work from that map. But they were the only ones where we really needed a map to use. But of course, from a digital perspective, you need a sort of narrative. What's the word? Not really a hook, but a place from which you can start. Yeah, I think we, we think of it as the frame. The frame, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for um, obviously for special stalkers, you can't have a map because the, the, uh, you, you're traveling any. I'm sorry. Spectral stalkers. You're travelling anywhere in time and space, virtually. Yeah. So the the time travel some, ones, yeah. yeah. Um, and for death, for um, beneath Nightmare Castle, again, it was, um, beneath Nightmare <laughs> Castle. <laughs> um, it was uh, it was it was all underground in a dungeon, and it, and it, again, I didn't I didn't create a map, and it it wasn't really map it wasn't really map driven. Um, uh, I think I did have a map for um, for. Portal of Evil, um, which... Portal of Evil. Yeah. Um, <laughs> typecast. <laughs> uh, but, but generally, in a way, this is the, this is in a sense yeah, the map. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. so something like this, is this something that you've generated during the writing process? Yeah. Or is it something, I mean, yeah. I'm guessing you didn't draw it before you started writing. No, 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 no. This, this is, this, um, this is created during the writing process, uh, and, every, and one of the reasons for doing it on uh, smaller pieces of paper is that, if you, if, is that if you go wrong, as it were, or you find that actually you've got, you've got too many bits that are, over, that are crossing over each other and you need to go back on, you can, you, you, can, you can scrap that piece of paper and start again, just transfer some of the data My across. My A3 sheets did have little crossed out bits on them, <laughs> around here and there. I mean, this is... This looks absolutely pristine, and that's because 
uh, I was able to just destroy the ones that didn't work and replace them with right. ones that did. So this is, this is virtual mind tech. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, exactly. But, it, it's, it's, but generally speaking, because you've got, because you, because you do think in advance, you, you are thinking, uh, I'm, I'm going to make a cluster of events, a cluster of locations and a cluster of events, and I know that, that the only way out of that is going to be to do a particular action, you know, to get this particular item and then move on, and I know where that's going to go next. You do, you have an idea where to place it on your paper, on your paper chart, where it's not going to interfere with anything else and where it will fit in with the next thing you want to have. Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting an image oh, of this. So I just oh. say add something to that, which is that that's quite different. I remember doing a talk on how to write kids' books and there was a chap with Philip Bardar and he just starts writing and then it comes out. I can't do a, a novel, generally, generally a novel, without having a beginning, middle and end already worked out. Like I did a 40,000 word kids' book and I had 10,000 words of notes before I even started. It changed my day of When I'm doing a game book, I can't start until I've at least mapped out the first 30 or 40 paragraphs on the flowchart because I know that's why I have lots more little notes. And then I start in chunks of about 30 or 40 paragraphs. So it's a very different way and I build on it same time. That, that actually leads into exactly the question I was, I was going to ask. Which it, it's, um, they, I've, I've heard it said that there are writers who are uh, pantsers and pantsers. And a pantser writes by the seat of their pants and just makes it up as they go along. And it's called George R. R. Martin. And there's a pantser <laughs> and plans everything out in advance and then sort of and then fills it in later. So it, it sounds like both of you are planners. I'm doing uh, that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. When, I mean, when I've, uh, when I've written uh, novels, uh, again, like Jamie, I, I I don't necessarily know all of the all of the things that are going to happen in between. They can change. Uh, they can change. Whatever, but, yeah. but I but I do I, I know where it begins and I know where I'll, where it's going to end. Um, and uh, and and I have written ones where I have actually drawn up something almost like this, <laughs> uh, although obviously in a rather more linear form, um, just to just to show. Uh, I mean. A, a story is a is a is always a journey, whether it's a physical journey through a landscape or a or a, 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 a psychological journey from one state of mind to another. But a story is always a journey, and you 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 uh, you can you can you can map out if you're if you're planning the whole thing in advance. You can map out all of the stages on that journey. Um, when you come to actually write the book. It may change you, because because characters develop a life of their own and and, thing, and things things change. Even the ending may change. You may you may have, you may have designed it to have a happy ending, and then you end, then you realise that actually you want something more bittersweet at the end. But um, but just bitter or just bitter. <laughs> um, but uh, but but yeah, just I de definitely definitely one for planning in advance. I just couldn't I couldn't cope. We're just sitting down with a, with a sitting down at a screen, starting typing, and not knowing where I was going. It would be, uh, would be impossible. So you're you planned it out. You've got your beginning, your middle, and end. Maybe your five sort of stages that the character has mm -hmm. to go through to get to the ending. You sort of roughly set up in a branch of it here, a branch of it there. Make it have a side bit over there. You started filling it in. You get to a point in the story where it becomes really obvious to the protagonist, uh, to the reader that there's a really big choice they really could take right now. Harry has gone to talk to Dumbledore and he could just tell him everything that he's discovered. This is chapter three. If he did, Dumbledore would say, don't worry, we know all about that already. You don't need to do any of this stuff, Harry. Just go back to class. The entire novel <laughs> wouldn't happen. In a Lydia book, you just don't do that. In an interactive book, it can be a bit of a sore thumb. How do you deal with it? What do you do? Well, we always tried as much as we could to minimize death matters. So, for instance, when we finally got to the evolution of doing the Fable Lands books, you could buy these things, an open world kind of traveling around, and buy resurrection deals. You might use your equipment, but you start again. Um, but the, the point being, death paragraphs can be a bit annoying if there's too many. Oh, no, no, no. I love death paragraphs. <laughs> I, love, I love writing them. But, uh, but if, if every choice is bad choice is met with death, yeah. <laughs> then it can be very frustrating. So if we try as much as we can, but we, we can't do it. You have to have death paragraphs. Otherwise, the book would turn into a 10,000 paragraph book. So we always always try as much as possible to put little clues about what the right choice was. And if, often if you made a wrong choice, you, something else would happen, but you would eventually come back to one of the other threads. 
but it would make your final challenge a bit harder. Mm. And um, the problem for the reader's point of view is trying to guess the mindset and logic of the writer. So um, we think what was likely to happen if you did such a where the Tigers example of hand-to-hand -hand combat battles. So you have to think, and so there were fights between, let's say, a sumo wrestler and a boxer, and um, or a sumo wrestler and a karate guy. So I would think the karate guy ought to go for the sumo wrestler's legs. If he tries to close to wrestle, he'll be crushed. The boxer needs to stand off and avoid the leg strikes from the karate guy and just go for hand-to-hand. -hand. So uh, it's not particularly a good example, but what I'm thinking of is that's how I would interpret it. And the reader has to guess what we thought was the right the outcome. And those are the sort of choices that you try and give the reader. Because it doesn't mean they're right. So there's an element of, of designing a puzzle, but the puzzle is for the player to work out what kind of story am I, am I in? And, and uh, yes. like that, yeah. like that yeah. kind of character. Yes, very much. Yeah. Also, in some of the books, it would be the best choice would be the one that you role play to choose. So what would, say, um, um, in the, where the title books you're a ninja of a particular kind of god, not a good god, but a martial arts, so what would be the right thing to do? And that can also be rewarded and punished if you choose the wrong one. An, an interesting feature of, of this is that it looks a bit like a maze. Um, and in a way it is, because you've got branching paths and you can choose which way you go, just like you would in a maze. But the difference between a game book and a maze is that in a maze, you have what are called mutually accessible centers. So you can go down a path and make a choice and you find yourself at another branch and you make another choice and you another branch and you make another choice and bloody hell, you found yourself back where, you, you, back where you've been before. But in the game book, you can't go back to where you've been before because things will have changed. If, you, Unless you don't. if, you've, killed a, if you've killed a troll in a room, you can't go back to that room because I can't write that there's a dead troll in there now, you know. Well, actually, <laughs> that's what we did. Yeah, and, and the fate of that, we managed to do that. I'll talk about that. You, yeah, I mean, you can, but it's, not the same, but it's not the same location. It's not the same numbered location in the book. Yeah, well. Can you? Yeah, yes, oh, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you about that, but it's not, it wouldn't, if we were to, there's not fine fantasy. Different because Final Fantasy always about linear storylines. Yes, yeah. And the idea is to create an open world sandbox so you could go anywhere. Yeah. And sometimes, well, we might, we might be doing that. Shall I talk about that now? Let's let Nina finish what he was saying. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Well, I think so. I think you. And what I've always thought that I mean, if you're in a if, if you're in a real situation, <laughs> if you're in a real life situation and you're down in a dungeon beneath the nightmare castle, um, you, um, and you and you open a door, working um, it out, and, you, uh, and, you, and you see that, and you see that there's you see that there's something really unpleasant in there. You've always got the chance to just say, no, I'm not bloody going in there. I close the door, walk, and walk back again. And, and you can't do that. I mean, you know, once you've once you once you've gone to a new paragraph in a game book, you've gone. You, and and that's in a traditional game book. In a traditional game book. And that's and that, in a sense, is why I don't mind putting in a fair number of death paragraphs because why? Because basically, death means you go back to the beginning and start again. It's it's the way of it's your way of 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 going back. In a, in a maze. I mean, in a maze, you can turn around and go back. In a game book, all you can do is die and start again. And uh, so I'm, I, 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 I always like to think up very imaginative and unpleasant ways to die. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to cheat my readers. I want to give them a really unpleasant experience as they're dying. Um, and, um, and then they can start again. Can I just say, talisman of death. Uh, I can't remember the number of the paragraph. 205. 205. <laughs> <laughs> She, she still remember, remembers it now. Uh, uh, she could recite the whole paragraph, but uh, she got in trouble for talking about it at school. But it involves going into the sewers, you fail a luck check, and a large harpoon slams through your guts and spills your guts onto... The last thing you see as you die is your guts spilling onto the sewer floor. And uh, this, got, uh, there was a, on the BBC News, there was the Talisman of Death, House of Hell, and there was another one, which is... Uh, and these were all very naughty. Top of really bad stuff. Yeah, but yeah. And they were, and they, and it was on the news about encouraging violence in children. And they read out some of that paragraph, I think. And uh, there was a kid who had a nightmare from it, which is, you know, I thought, oh my god, that's awful. Maybe we should change everything. And then the next day, sales of talisman, they're shot up. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the 
boys went to their mummies. I want the one that gives you nightmares, mummy. Oh, oh, no. And so, you know, thank you. So to, to drag the panel back from gruesome death descriptions. Um, <laughs> So Peter was saying that it's like a maze that you that, that, that there are these dead ends you can't go around in a loop. You were kind of suggesting there's a way you could give the player a step ladder to climb over the hedge for the second time round that that loop. Obviously, Fable fans did a lot of this. So the, we've done like the Falcon series of time travel, and that had its own challenges. And Way of the Tiger was kind of Lone Wolf style single player storyline, and we've done lots of fighting fantasy game books for free. Uh, but between us, we've done quite a few. And then, so we moved on to what we wanted to evolve to was a kind of sandbox open world, no single storyline, hundreds of different mini quests, and all of these different choices that the player could make. So we could go in and see uh, there's the ogre's lair. Uh, it could be a big fight, um, but you created a role playing character at the beginning. You could be a wizard, you could be a fighter, you could be a bard, you could be a troubadour, as we called it, a kind of priest. So you had to think about what your power was. So going into an ogre's lair for a hand-to-hand -hand combat would probably be a fight to a high, bit higher level as a mage, and you then be given the choice of going back. But the interesting thing about that was, generally, a given paragraph might be... The way we had to think of it was any given paragraph was a location in the real world, not a paragraph in a book. So it was more like a computer game. So you would often, if you went to the port, or the yellow port in one of our books, uh, that would always be the same paragraph. And there would be tick boxes if required, and you tick them every time, and then you'd be given the option if you have three tickets that ticks. You visited that port three times. You get sent to another paragraph where the governor has been overthrown, and there's been a revolution, and someone else is in charge, or the city's burned down. Or you might go to a, a tower, the ogre's tower, you kill the ogre. You pick up what we used to call were code words, and at the back of the book there were all these little words. Ash, or in the first book they would begin with A, in the second book they would begin with B. And uh, if you had the code word so and so ticked in the back of the book, you would go to another paragraph. So you go to the ogre's lair again, you've already killed it. This time you face the ghost of the ogre. And that meant that we could adjust the world according to what you did. So you really felt like you were changing the world around you. You could it meant every book had seven to eight hundred paragraphs. Where's Paul Gresky? He did book seven in the series. And he did like a thousand paragraphs. One thousand two hundred. Sorry. And um, because the choice, you get more and more options. But the one way around that was we did very short, pithy uh, paragraphs that had, were low on description and high on atmosphere and flavour. And so uh, that way, certain. And we also had places that were paragraph number that was your townhouse that you bought in a city, and you could go there and you'd have a, a box that was your cache, and you'd write in it the stuff you wanted to store in there, and cross it off your character sheet. So if you died and you had a resurrection deal, you would lose the stuff you're currently carrying, but it meant your same character, you could keep them, you could go back, get some stuff that you pre stashed So we tried to make a computer game without a computer in the 90s, and then computer games did it better than that, and then <laughs> game books basically died anyway. But that was the interesting way of trying to make the game book remember what you'd done without having to always do it based off an item that you may have picked up on. Because so, we okay. have no idea what you might have picked up. We're actually almost out of time already. I think we, we only have the half an hour and I kind of wanted to try out questions. But I very quickly, I just wanted to ask on that, that changing from a linear story-based flow to a kind of map-based, almost computer game-like structure, as a writer, did you find that liberating or frustrating? Did you find that the stories you told had to be kind of a bit more kind of mess? Well, or did you find it, it was harder in a sense, as you had to have lots and lots and lots of little pithy storylines, each of which could have been a novel. Uh, which is always, it was a bit always like a game book, it was always like that, but this is Max up. So you'd have to have, you'd have a constant... There's 100 mini game books in some Yeah, games. yeah, yeah. yeah. And con all these different plots and bad guys and different ideas, which was fine at the time, but I'm not sure if I'd be able to do it now. <laughs> no, I know. It, it, sound, it, it sounds it's incredibly like, difficult to me. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting for me, because like, in adapting the sorcery games, we started basically with that model. I mean, Fable Man yeah. was one of our inspirations for thinking that this was a possible thing to do, and obviously we did it in the digital context. And the more that I've written, the more that I've moved towards writing sort of single flow novel style game books, which I, I find much harder because um, I never know how do you decide whether, how do you stop choices being arbitrary? Because one thing you described it being like a maze, 
And the reason mazes are annoying is you get to a junction and you can go left or right, you've got no bloody idea. Yeah. It, it comes back to this thing that Jamie was saying about how uh, each book has a kind of atmosphere, it has a kind of ambience. And, um, and, if you're, uh, and what we want the reader to do is to pick up the ambience of the book and that will give them an idea of which choices to make. Um, it's, if you, if you, uh, and I think that's always done conscious as you're writing it, but you, 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 uh, you, you, you're writing a particular type of book and, you, and if the reader goes along with it, as it were, they'll, 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 make them, they'll tend to make more right choices. Yes. Not, you punish them. And, and, and if not, yeah. they get the death paragraph. Cool. All right. Well, we are pretty much at time. Really fascinating, actually. I think I've got time for maybe one, two questions. If they're good, quick, then I'll actually comment. Oh, can I? Oh, brilliant. All right. Have incredibly boring questions then. Uh, yes. Never noticed you've got a green T-shirt. Uh, two things. One is how did your games workshop, your lesbian games workshop. How did they decide that you know, it's time for you to write a book or nominating you to write a book? And the, other, and the other question is, is, was there any kind of flavour guide or guidance given to you to make sure that when you wrote a book, it fitted the, the uh, Fighting Fantasy world? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, the, answer, the answer is, I didn't write a Fighting Fantasy book until I, until I left Games Workshop. And that was kind of because I felt it was a to an extent, of, of, yeah, there was a conflict of interest. I mean, I was, I was general manager of Games Workshop, and I, I frankly was a bit appalled by the way that all of my colleagues were <laughs> spending their time writing books rather than, <laughs> rather than doing their work. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I had to do something. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, you know it, it was, I mean, I, uh, I, I was made redundant from Games Workshop when Games Workshop moved to Nottingham. Um, and I didn't want to go to Nottingham. Um, and, um, and it was almost part of my redundancy package. Oh, well, by the way, you can write a book. Uh, so I, so I, um, and that's, and that's, that's why I didn't write one until number 25 or whatever beneath Nightmare Castle is. Um, so the short answer is you got fired. That's yeah. how you got chosen. <laughs> um, and Don't advise this to <laughs> Uh, and what was the second part of the question was... Flavor, flavor guides. Oh, flavor guidance. Um, well, no, not really. Um, uh, I mean, I, I set out to try and make every one of, every one of mine as different as possible. And um, they all got... Oh, it's Steve. Hello, hello, hello Steve. <laughs> yeah, that bastard Steve Jackson. God. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. We'll get rid of it, sorry. <laughs> And get someone more powerful than yeah. me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so no, there wasn't. There, I mean, I mean every, you had to submit your proposal to uh, to Puffin, and they would and they would say whether it was acceptable or not. But but generally speaking, no. I don't. There wasn't a sort of printed guide sheet or anything like that. Because I was there really early, so number eleven. I actually was typing it up in Ian Livingstone's office. Because that, um, in those days, interestingly, me and my friend Mark Smith, we wrote that all of Talisman of Death in pencil, in longhand. We didn't have a computer, there wasn't much a thing. And one of the earliest word processes was in Ian and Steve's offices, so I was able to type it up. But then, early on like that, they were so desperate for more content, they couldn't put out enough Final Fantasy books. So anyone that could do it, and because we were so close to Ian and Steve, we understood how they all worked, you know, some of us, uh, Trevor Graver proofread the early Final Fantasy books and we'd seen them and knew it. There were only a handful of people in the country that could just work it, do it, it's quickly like that. So uh, then it was too hard to resist, because there was all this stuff going on in the, in the boardroom at Workshoppers, um, it was too hard to resist walking into a publisher, an alternative publisher, with our whole way of the tiger world already there. They would just offer you money on the spot. We forgot how successful, I mean, Death Trap Dungeon was 250,000 in, in, in sales and all over the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, the, the, the first five books were at numbers one, two, three, four, and five in the children's bestseller list. Yeah, I mean, so it's puffing. As a millennial, I can't tell you how much we're enjoying listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, it, so there was no time or even thought that they had to fit in into a world. It was only later when they started doing the Titan. Um, encyclopedia and Pearl Mark Gascoigne had to create, put everything in into a world. So 
one of our books was The Sword of the Samurai, which just created an island and it was all martial artsy and didn't really fit in. And so it ended up on the continent of Kool. I remember we were almost finished it and someone had said, this needs to be in, was it Kool? No. It was, yeah. We yeah we, this has to be, the island has to be in Kool. Where? Oh, okay. So uh, that, it was all sort of just happened, it, was, it all happened so fast and so quickly and that it wasn't really planned. So later it was made into a coherent world. Let's sort of take the question. What you were saying before about trying to suggest uh, to the reader uh, what's going on in the book to sort of prompt them to make the right choices. It's a well known fact that uh, Carl Sargent, aka Pete Martin, studied psychology. You think there's an element of psychology involved uh, in writing these books? Particularly if you want to create fear, like, uh, you know, beneath part of their cast, I've always thought of that as more of a horror game for the no, def no, that, that was the idea, definitely, to make it as horrible as possible, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, it, my partner, The Way of the Tiger, in the couple of the game books, Talisman of Death, and Sword of the Samurai, he'd actually done a degree in psychology. So maybe that got in there. I hadn't planned it that way, that was much more, kill them! <laughs> kill them all! One thing I remember hearing when I was adapting sorcery was that if you give people a choice of going right or left, they almost always go right. So I always go left. Yeah, so, but, and I thought that maybe people knew this because they thought maybe they go left to check out the dead end and then they go right. Yes, but I would you like to see... What made you think of blowing up the staircase? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, in the end of uh, Beneath Nightmare Castle, where in the correct way staircase get blown up, what made you think of that? Uh, I, yeah, no, I, I was always trying to think up new and original ways to kill people. Um, and so, um, uh, I mean, I can't, it's, it's, you're talking 35 years ago now, so I'm, I'm, I can't actually remember what was going through my mind at the time. Probably something pretty sick and depraved, I imagine. Yeah. Um, let's take another question. Are there any more questions? Hello, yes. You mentioned the Sword of the Samurai thing. Do you have consciously in your mind? No, I don't think so. No, I mean, when you're when you're doing because what you're doing is you're looking at this, and so it's not so much right and left as in you know in your mind you're looking at you're, you're looking at a flowchart rather than thinking in terms of yeah. Right. But I mean, to to flip the question around a bit, do you ever have a sense of the the first and the second option in the list that you're writing? Do you ever put a preference there? Like, if, we, if, we were deliberately, if we had three or four choices, we knew which was the correct one, and we'd always try and mix it up so that you couldn't guess uh, yeah. the correct one. It's always like a good one. These two blokes, yeah, it's always number yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we'd mix that up, but also we would have choices that would be like, you'd cross and uh, play the wheat fields of, uh, or the marsh of death. And so, you know, there's kind of clue. It's like, you know, marsh of death. Yeah, yeah. Most, yeah, yeah. Oh, which one well, I actually I just wanted to drop it an anecdote in my area, if I'm allowed. Uh, when we were adapting sorcery at the end, there's a maze at the, at the very, very end of it, and we thought for a laugh what we'd do is measure whether the player, every time the player went left and every time the player went right, and if there was a preference, then we would flip the maze so the correct route was the other one. <laughs> um, and the entire maze mirror images. No one ever noticed. I don't know whether or not it was effective as a thing, but it was totally fun to do. <laughs> Sorry, you had one. Yeah, uh, one of the most frustrating things when you come to a T-junction, you can go left or right, with no information whatsoever. Do, do you consciously limit those chances, or do you think I'm going to have so many of those? I would try not to put those in. Yeah, yeah. I but at least put something a bit more interesting, like yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't get a point to you. That's something. Use the fighting fancy or the reverse fighting fancy rule, depending on who put the book. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Now you try. I mean, you do try not to have just the, those ones where there's just a bare choice. Um, I mean, I, 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 I would hope, I would like to think there were very few of those in my books. So that, that's interesting, actually. So what, what you're saying almost is, like, when you're writing a normal novel, one of the things you're always looking for is moments of cliche when it just feels dull, and you think, oh, I need to, I need to bump this up. So in a way, when you write a choice that looks just arbitrary, well, that's having said that, that's if a we were going to have an arbitrary choice, we always try nine times out of ten to make left a different kind of adventure and write another kind of adventure. So one wouldn't be our to death. There'd be just two, there'd be the two different threats, so it didn't matter too much. Sometimes mine would be arbitrary death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't avoid it. Uh, it's like real life. 
so I'm talking about some of the kind of multi-visit mechanics and some of the different ways the moments work and the kind of stories. Are there any other creative mechanics that you tried out and just didn't work? Like what are the ideas that you live on the platform you thought? Of course not. <laughs> As if I could make a mistake. I, I, I mean, that's a very difficult question because I'm sure, I'm sure there were lots, but the trouble is they're all on the cutting room floor and I can't remember. But I guess a lot of ideas that get left on the cutting room floor get left there for a good reason, right? Because they, they just don't well, work at all. Mostly for a good reason, but sometimes for, for reasons of um, that they work, but but they're not, they're just not appropriate for the book you're writing, or they're, or they're they're not appropriate for the for the format you're writing in. I mean, I I, um, I mean, I was always coming up with different ideas for different types of game books, which uh, which by the time I was doing it, it wasn't the situation that Jamie described where publishers are falling over themselves to take you on. Um, so I mean, I, so none of mine ever saw the light of day except the one that except the Doctor Who role playing game that I wrote with Ian, um, which had a. a, a a, a rather marvellous combat system that, um, that was mainly Ian's work, I have to say. Um, but, uh, but, but basically, you, 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 can, you can come up with lots of ideas, but as I say, they all go, they all go by the wayside if they don't fit the book. Is, the is there anything that either of you wish, like, wish you had had done, or wish you'd done, well, or what there's a few ideas that we, could, we never got published, but they're not in the story, not really systems, yeah. Well, there was one, it was called The Keeper of the Seven Keys, and it was, you played, it was a bit of a different game book, so you played a kind of, it was like the dungeon, dungeon keeper, but way before that, so you were this wizard who had kept imprisoned a demon lord, and you had to keep everyone away from it, but the, the world around you started to betray you as the evil demon lord, so gangs of adventurers, paladins and heroes, would keep trying to break into your tower and destroy you, and you had to stop them. So at the beginning of the book, you would place your goblin horde here and your uh, your winged demon gaunt here. And it was a really nice idea. We had a system, a kind of turn-based system. I can't remember how it worked, but it kept track of time. So that you know, as as the adventurers all attacked at different points of time in the timeline, um, which Dave Morris brilliantly did. In, have any of you read the Can Can You Brexit? Uh, game book. Find it on Amazon. There's, you you play the Prime Minister and the idea is for you to stay in power, so Theresa May, for instance, actually lost the game book. Um, but that has all of these uh, things that, as chunks of time that pass, uh, um, kept, I think, with a complicated system of tick boxes that they've done it in such a way it was really easy for the player, but quite complicated to keep track of, because it was all about do you deal with EU citizens first or do you deal with the fishing problem and all that kind of thing? And then actually, it was brilliantly accurate up until uh, the Parliament started. We got everything, we got, it was all could happen in the book. You could have leadership challenges. But then when they started turning down May's deal, and everything that's happened then, it was just so insane. It was just like, you never could possibly have predicted the way it turned out. So, um, for, but up to that point, we were pretty accurate. It's sobering, though, to end up. There's on Amazon if you want it. Can you Brexit without breaking Britain? Yeah, buy it now while you still have an income. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? I think maybe we have time for one or two. I'll see you later. I'm going to go there. So one of the classic ideas was that if you chose the right routes, anywhere in the theory is going to be Did you really think about that when you were designing this book? Or is it more a case of it's good enough in the end of the book that the Sorry, um, so one of the lines is that in the books, if you were to the perfect path, yeah. Yeah, anyone could do it. Did you kind of follow that? Did you create that most attention? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, we wanted it to be done, I mean, by chance you could get the perfect route. We didn't want to make it too hard. So yes, it should always be possible to do it. You mean like if you roll the, one of the Final Fantasy books, I can't remember which one, but someone was complaining that you had to have a skill at a level at least to, yeah. to complete it. Yeah, well, ours were much, uh, all of the books were much more um, 
forgiving in that sense? Are you always trying to make sure that just anyone with average stats could do it? Yeah, I, I never, I, I never wanted it to be dependent on on the die rolls. Uh, I, yeah. I, I mean, it, it is dependent on making the right choices, obviously. But I didn't. But I wanted you to be able to get through from the beginning to the end. I mean, I, I mean, ideally. Without actually having to fight anyone, you know. I mean, it was, uh, it was so. So there was no. Yeah, well, that created. Yeah. It was always like, can't think of a to fight. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there always are. There were always were one or two fights. But 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 um. But if you could find a way through that avoided most of the combat, uh, I, I always tried to make it. It was it was perfectly easy to get through. Um, it, and, you know, there was always a relatively easy route. That, yeah. that didn't tax you too much. There's also an interesting thing is about how the way of the tiger once and lone wolf, you sort of went up levels. And that was easy to handle in the way of the tiger, but with Fable Lands, and Ball, with Fable Lands 7, there's, the system kind of started to break down at high levels. Because you, you could become a very high level character and have kind of 12s and everything. And it's very hard to find a challenge. So that, that can become a headache if you want to do too many books. We'll have to work out what we can do with the One interesting that, thing, thing uh, from yeah. me about the, what you were saying about choices and fights and sorcery, we tended to use the combat as our lowest common denominator thing. So if you, you could get past an encounter by doing interesting things, and then if it all went wrong, we just put a fight at the bottom of it to catch people who made terrible choices, which was quite a nice pattern to have. It's quite a good use of the system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Interestingly, you touched on the psychology of Jeremy and Phil. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, the likes of Joseph Campbell feature any kind of influence in the writing process or the structuring process of the story. We, we had great, but there were too many steps in it. Yeah. And there's always, um, what was the other one? Well, yeah, we did that back. Working on a huge computer game version, and there's another. This is the hero's journey, right? Yes, yeah, the hero's journey. Yeah, right. There's also a book by a chap called VJ Prope, and he does this thing called Propian Analysis, and it breaks down fairy tales into formulas. And we we're trying to do that to create a god AI that would create stories in a computer game. Um, the hero's journey, though, always begins like it does with Luke, so you know, as it refuses the GS that's put upon him. Um, and has to have other stuff, and there's also then the hero gets wounded and goes away and licks his wounds and comes back more powerful. Yeah. Those just don't work in a computer game. I mean, you know, they do it, they can work in a computer game, but in a game book, they would be very difficult to put in. Yeah. Because the correct choice would be refusing to go on, yeah. you know, so don't buy this book. To lick your wounds, turn the face very far. Yes. It's it's more powerful. powerful to to the the yes. Yes. yes, exactly. So yes. it's yeah. the, the internal hero's journey and the external journey in the world, and how they, how they composite. And tell the whole story. Yes. I've certainly, I've certainly, is this working? It's <laughs> <laughs> one back. Uh, yeah, that's better. Um, I've certainly used Campbell's theories, uh, I mean, not exactly, but I've certainly had them in the back of my mind when I've written novels. But I, 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 as Jamie says, I, I just don't think it's, it's as applicable to game books because you've got other constraints, you know, you've got, yeah. the, 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 there are things that you've got to do in a game book. The, 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 and, and also fundamentally, we don't really have any control over the actual hero's personality yeah. in that sense, because it's going on in your head. And we can't say, you know, we always have to avoid gender, and you also have to avoid saying, you're so angry, you're outraged at this moral wrong, you decide you're going to avenge it. People don't like to be fed their, their characters' feelings too much. I mean, you could do it a bit when, in a game, in like The Way of the Tiger, where you are, a, a, we know half of what your character's like. You worship this god, you have these skills, you have this mission. But generally, it's hard to... Can you still yeah. fit the three-act structure, dramatic structure? Yeah, the game? yeah. So you can't always... Can't do that at the yeah, and, 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 and I'm in control now. Because, yeah. I, because I've got all the microphones. I talk really loudly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think we're out of time. We could probably carry on talking about this stuff all day. Are you guys going to be around the rest of the convention? Uh, yeah, we'll sort of for, for, for people who are signing.
Okay, all right, so you can go and get them to ask questions while they sign. So yeah, we'll be there. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks for joining